Hi, Greg Perry, the Historic Preservationist. Welcome to the Sign of the Tea Tavern in historic Woodstown, New Jersey. Originally built in circa 1669, located where Routes 40 and 45 meet in historic Woodstown, New Jersey. Um, here were some reflections on a, on a very, very different uh, Christmas day in 2020. Um, a very sad Christmas day as we we think about uh, our fellow Americans. Some of us do. Some of us think of our cultural heritage. Uh, Americans in food lines today, eight, nine million of them in cars. Uh, so we, we take a pause to uh, send them our prayers and, and, and best wishes. And if we could help them, we would, believe me. Uh, but uh, welcome to the Sign of the Key Tavern, again, New Jersey's oldest and first tavern um, located in historic Woodstown, New Jersey. Um, and as you can take a look through the, uh, the cage bar, this is the first and oldest drive up window, colonial drive up window in the state of New Jersey. So uh, a little time for reflection here. Um, as I mentioned in the uh, hearth room, uh, it's been an honor and, and uh, just a great uh, breath and of knowledge to have diaries given by extended members of the Shivers family and inventories of what was in this tavern when it was located and open for the first day. Uh, in 1669, we know the number of patrons that were here. We know what was being served. Um, we also know all the furniture, all the accoutrements they had. They were just starting out. Um, it was a bucolic back post, um, you know, what, six, seven, eight miles from Salem, New Jersey. And, and remember, that's how taverns were placed as far as your horse is going to die. Your horse is going to not die, but it's going to, it's going to, uh, it's going to be uh, spent for the rest of the day. You could trade a horse at the tavern here or you could spend the night. So that's that's where we are. So so the sign of the key here has been restored um, in as best as possible with uh, diaries and inventories, and in addition to witness marks, witness marks on this wide pine flooring, and this cage bar as we're looking at it right now was. Um, disassembled and put into wooden lead line lead line boxes in the basement. The condition of the uh, of all these planks and superstructure and cage of the bar was filled with black mold over the years, and uh, so it had to go a, a stripping, a bleaching, a whole series of processes to get it back to where it should be and in a condition that could be reinstalled. Um, so you're looking at a very um, thick center wall here that divides the sign of the key tavern in two. And that's uh, basically because there's a stairway just about 22 inches wide located um, straight ahead, as you can see, into where the food pass through is from the hearth room into the tavern room. And it was a, an access point that uh, the uh, the individual would just be John Shivers could get upstairs very quick, quickly if there was a ruckus, uh, an uprising in the uh, the upstairs of the tavern. So that's why the wall is so wide. So as you can see, um, maybe you could hold eight to ten individuals here in the tavern, <laughs> and it was very, very backwoods bucolic at the time. Uh, so not a lot of uh, individuals in, but just remember this tavern would serve as a as a, as a meeting place for who's in charge of the military, the British, the colonials, um, for religious groups. Um, starting up of Woodstown eventually would meet here. Um, political groups, uh, you would get your mail here. The in individual who was running the cage bar. And remember, the one of the key, or why, why is it the cage bar? Is because alcohol was one of the most sought after drugs you could get. And it was very expensive in the day. And people would kind of do anything to steal it, just like other, th other items today. But so when the uh, individual who was operating the cage bar had to leave the bar, there's a door in the front bottom that he would have to slide out on his knees. 
and he would drop the cage down from the ceiling and lock it up with a huge lock. And we have an old 18th century lock that's not original to the 17th, but it's close. It gives us an idea of what was there. So the, uh, the drive up window, as you can see there, it's amazing. This was concealed in the walls in this building. So when I was doing the conservation and preservation of the building, the double hung sash deteriorated, was inside of the walls and they clabbered it over and they actually plastered it over at some point. And we think it was sometime around 1946. So what a, what a wonderful find to find one of the oldest drive up tavern windows in the state of New Jersey, curbside service at its original. So phenomenal. But we can see here we have two windows in the tavern, um, which would not have been here. So because again of alcohol, um, this tavern only comprised three windows, which were in the front of it, three double hung sash. Okay. And in the back, there would have been no windows because of fear of break in robbery. So um, when this tavern moved here, it moved here in 1726. And we have three Native Americans and three oxen drug that the basically two miles from where it was Route 40 and Route 45 to the present location of 68 North Main Street and hooked up with the Shivers house. The son of John Shivers, Samuel Shivers, built this house in 1724. And he had two kids by 1726, two children, and he needed more space. And he felt that he was selling the land of the tavern on the corner, it's 40 and 45, and it comprised the tavern. And chances are they would have burned this tavern down and used the, uh, the hardware for another type dwelling. So he seized the moment. Um, he, John Shivers always worked. John Shivers always worked with Native Americans. When he bequested the tavern the land to Samuel, his son, um, there was a few Native Americans running one of the first sawmills in the county on Woodstown Lake, where the spillway is located today. And so he he pulled these two individuals out and says, "Bring that tavern to me," and they disassembled everything peg by peg, tree nail by tree nail, labeled it all and drug it up and reassembled it within two and a half to three weeks at 68 North Main Street. And they literally doubled the size of the Shivers house. I mean, it set the house off a little bit in that it wasn't symmetrical. So as we look at the Shivers house today, the Shivers House Museum, we can see it's totally symmetrical because in 1813, um, the third section was added by the Shins. And what it did, it balanced the house out perfectly. So it remains that wonderful Georgian character with the quans or stress stones at the corners, which were probably eliminated by Betty Lippincott in uh, 1946. She took them off and I could find a ghosting through infrared photography and later put them back on. So just a wonderful find here at the Shivers House Museum. Um, so... But yeah, so we, we, we sit here today and, and you know, uh, we have the curator, the Dr. Sage Franklin. Um, he's the feline curator of the house. And, you know, we ponder um, cultural heritage, historical heritage, how it's in such a low point today. And, and, and I, I have a lot of questions on the, um, the Historic Preservationist podcast and some of the Instagram uh, venues that, that we have and we put out and uh, people want to know and I have no answers for why does this wonderful furniture you're looking at the pewterware the chairs which is furniture yes the horology the clocks the sconces the period sconces why are they of not interest today to younger people by and large and I have no answers I guess they, they continue to be more enthralled with um, an ever-changing way of life, a technological way of life. Um, but these type of artifacts remain very low. So some of us, some of us need to be custodial ambassadors to maintain this cultural material um, for future generations to come. Um, you know, if you ask what turns me on, it's these decorative arts from the various periods that are overlapping here in the museum. And the Shivers House is exemplifying, exemplifying th four different centuries of build. 
the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th century of build. Yes. Um, so wonderful, wonderful stuff here in historic Woodstown, New Jersey. And many of the people don't even realize how old um, this section of the dwelling is. And uh, it's, it's amazing. We have a, a three-part dwelling, as I just mentioned. And the, the portion that I'm sitting in now, um, New Jersey's oldest colonial tavern, in the walls, once you strip back the clapboard to check on everything, Everything in this area was out of white oak. It's very rot, extremely rot resistant, vermin resistant, fungal resistant, damp resistant. It was the most intact portion of the entire house, much more intact than the 1813 portion at the north end of the structure. So just to mention what we have here in the Shivers Diaries, there were two clocks, two separate clocks, and they were Oh, 1656 uh, to 1675. And you're looking at, you're hearing a real strong escaping sound. Extraordinarily strong. 30 hour clocks, obviously, and you can see they're one handers. And just remember the proletariat, the basic people in the day did not have a clock. They had no idea what time it is. So come to around 1700, 1710 in England, when the original owners of these style clocks started um, passing. These clocks came up at auction and individuals after 1700 started buying them. And even at that point, they still didn't know what a minute was. That's why there's no minute hand on these clocks, just by the hour. But if you were lucky enough to have one, and these are called cottage clocks, English cottage clocks out of White Oak. If you were lucky enough to have one of these, you were so far ahead of the game at whatever your business was, farming, fur trading, whatever it was in the UK at that time, because you could be at a place on time. Nobody else could be there on time. And it was extraordinarily important. Horology was at its infancy, but the horologist, the horological scientist, the astronomer, the, um, the sundial maker, the astrolabe maker, these people are cutting edge, it got no better. These were the scientists of the day. And it puts you, the person own, owning a timepiece, which it could have been a very crude watch at the time, which may have only kept time within an hour a day of accuracy, um, or these two wonderful early timepieces. Your business could be so far ahead of everyone else, you became a real wealthy individual in just a few years, literally. So, very, very important stuff. So, um, but you know, back to the historical materialism, um, you know, I, I have no answers why the value at auction of historic decorative arts is so low today. Again, other than, you know, when I first, uh, my, my first proposition I rendered a, a few minutes ago, um, you know, and people, younger people call this dirty, this furniture is dirty, it's old, the wood's old and dirty. But just imagine, this This clock dates to in the, the 17, 17, 1760s. Just imagine how old the wood is. This tree was 2,000 years old at that point. So this tree is what, 2,300 years old that produced this wonderful artifact? It lives on. But today we find so many people want to discard this type of history and it's it's absolutely shocking. We've never taken such a back seat to our cultural heritage worldwide. This is not just an American phenomenon. It's much more pronounced here in America, perhaps because we're quote younger than Britain or France or Germany or Italy, but uh, it's just not looked upon as something we want to maintain. And, and, and it's true. It's a very simplistic uh, saying, you know, by Franklin, if we, if we don't know where we came from, we don't know where we're going to. We absolutely don't. And I think it can be um, seen today in our, in our politics. Clueless, clueless. And we see how inept our constitution really is. And I'm, believe me, I, I've been guilty of this, thinking that we had a wonderful paper there. And maybe it one, may have been a wonderful paper in, in, the, uh, in the 18th century when it was drawn up, but there's too many loopholes now. Too many loopholes that corrupt individuals can get through. And, and really harm our country, harm our people. When our people need help today, 
you know, Christmas Day, they need help eating and, and with their rents and things like this and don't due to a pandemic. Uh, so it's very sad, but, but um, back to cultural heritage. I mean, here at the Shivers House Museum, I, Greg Perry, conservator and horological conservator, uh, conservator, fine decorative arts, gilder, marketer. Um, I am so impassioned by saving the past and it could be architecturally speaking, horology speaking, or again, decorative arts, but we need to save these objects. They're, they're dying upon us. They're getting thrown away um, exponentially every day. Every day we're alive. And even, even worse in times like this, when people are struggling for their livelihood, they're struggling to eat. Um, I positioned a place of isolation, so um, trying to when something good comes up for auction, I'm still trying to put my neck out there and make a stab for it. Not the everyday run-of-the-mill bucolic uh, Windsor chairs we're looking at today or tavern tables. I've become more inclined to help save what I would find here is the great British furniture of the 17th and 18th centuries and an occasional French piece if I can, you know, it's, it's a little bit over the edge sometimes, but still. Um, and unfortunately, we just don't see a lot of promise. We, we see, um, perusing the internet the other day, seeing uh, a lot of people doing uh, reproductions, but they're not, they're not true reproductions, you know, and selling it from some dealers in Connecticut, Massachusetts. They're not true. They're not true to the art. But nevertheless, they're, they're trying to maintain um, the feeling, the ambiance of the 18th century which is extraordinarily important. It's very important that we can do whatever we can to salvage this time period for generations to come. And that's why we're doing it. And that's why it's a passion to show individuals that, that aren't quite getting it yet, where our past has been, that don't care about it. And it, it'll come around, but we're in a cycle now that's huge and a cycle that's been uh, very slow to come back to square and, and looking for that dearly. Um, what's what's happening to us uh, that we don't care about our history and, and I'm sure if you look at the numbers prior to the pandemic uh, Williamsburg, Winterthur and, and the like museums in general are down considerably. We still have people looking at this these paintings, these contemporary paintings where people throw paint against the wall and throw into an airplane propeller it splashes against the wall and they bring huge numbers at auction. I don't get it. I don't get it and it's it's individuals without an understanding of, of quality, of proportion, the golden mean, the ionic columns. What has happened to us? What has happened to us? Where have we gone? How far have we slipped? So, uh, but um, so happy that the tavern still stands and can be a beacon of light. And it's all about, it's all about education. It's about teaching people that, you know, uh, what's, what's gone before them. And, and, and if we do things right, Will continue to be here in the future and it can be politically speaking uh militarily speaking and and just the, the basics of how do you take care of things how do you cherish things how do you respect things even things that you don't like that it's it's an amalgamation and accumulation of how we got here and, and it's very important i don't like all the things that you see here in front of me i don't but this is part of our past and Fortunate, to be, fortunate enough to be a caretaker and a curator, a, a custodian of these objects in this tavern, this, this restored tavern. Um, can't tell you how fortunate it is to be here, um, to save things of the past, to save things, and to be dedicated in a lifetime of, you know, getting training and, and, and crossing minds with people all over the world, whether you're sitting with colleagues and friends looking over at the Bastille Monument having a, a meal or in, in, you know, in the Chateau de Versailles having a meal and, and getting my education there at the famous Ecole Bull, the infamous, or Westine College in London, or friends that, um, in the British Horological Institute. So uh, just wonderful ambassadors all over the world and not just, unfortunately, dealing with bucolic bump bumpkins which we have too many of them in here. I mean, look, some of them try in Salem County, New Jersey, but some of them are swayed by, you know, the church that's donating, or the individual that's donating too much to their church, that 
they won't go against someone who's polluting the environment or polluting the drinking water in their community, but yet they still aggrandize them because it's putting money in their coffers or people that are faking history, that are um, upgrading their houses or, or just because they buy a, his, quote, historic house, which many of them are in, in county-wide or South Jersey-wide and West Jersey. And just because they do that, they're instantaneous, they're aficionados, they're, they're masters of, of, of history, and they're not. Um, are they, do they maintain history? Yes, to a way they do. But unfortunately, some of them propagate history in the wrong way. So um, it's like everything else today. I mean, just remember back in the 70s, I'm a, a product of the late 60s and 70s, is that, you know, um, it was every, uh, every kid's dream who wanted to be a mu musician to, to land a record label. And it took, it could take years. It takes luck, strokes of luck to meet that executive, to have him listen to your, your, uh, your tape, so to speak, and, and to be the fortunate one. And today you can, you can get a CD out and you can record, record yourself today and put it out there and put fake, fake electronic music in, and you're, 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 you're an instant success. So it's, it's people that don't want to put their time in. People that don't want to put their time in today as being an apprentice. Back, going back to Paris, Go to the Eco Bull, you're still a seven year apprentice, whether you're into brass or bronze doré or upholstering, furniture making, furniture restoration, you're still a seven year apprentice and in many programs in England. Um, here in America, I find that we just want the quickest, easiest way. Too many people come to me, you know, they want to, they want to say, can I apprentice unto you and this and that? And I say, no, no, you know what? I don't have apprentice programs. I don't do that. It's not, it's not illegal in America. I don't do that. Um, and I've been, I've been ripped off and stolen from so many times. I've been stolen from twice this year, twice this year, once by a worker, and once by a client, tools and things like that. So it's very, uh, very sad, and, and, but it continues to happen here. Um, and it's, it's kind of the American way, but, but we have a lot of great people here in, in, in the tri-state area that are doing things to promote history. So save houses and historic towns that are falling apart. So you have to take the good with the bad. So um, hopefully we have some, uh, some better times ahead. Hopefully sometimes, you know, things are gonna start changing the first of the year. Um, me uh, going back into furniture making, uh, backing off a little bit of restoration, a little bit of horology, starting to produce some cases of tall case clocks, some, uh, some table furniture and things of that getting back into carving. It's been a, a 20, you know, 20 year, 18, 19 year hiatus. So, and it's again, that's when this huge shift in the appreciation of decorative art started. It started with antiquity, it started and it stopped with people doing high-end copies and reproductions. So, uh, so, so getting back into that. So uh, just doing some reflection here and self-reflection. I put a lot of time into this and I think I'm titled to say that I want to say to everyone out there. Um, so, well, anyway, so uh, sitting here, the sign of the tea cavern, sign of the key tavern, uh, Greg Perry. I'm uh, just going to take a walk around, going to look at all the objects. We've been just going back and forth a little bit back. Look at some bloody good engraving here um, on the brass style of this British brown oak. I believe I misspoke most spoke before. It's not white oak, it's British brown oak. And you know, listening to a great tick, a great tick tock. Great beat and a great bell at that because the bell needed to be had on the outskirts of town or the outside of your, uh, uh, when you're working because you needed to hear what time it was. Let's just take a listen to that bell. This is a wonderful bell, even with the windows up. Computer as John Shivers would have had it back in the uh, late 17th century. Some periods, candle sconces with a little bit of mirror to reflect all the light you could because remember, candles are very expensive. And the salvage found in the middle of the wall, the, uh, the drive up double hung sash windows.
Empty patrons, a sign of the pandemic. A wonderful settee bench. Pewter measures in this wonderful English brown oak cupboard. And another one-hander in elm. British elm. It's a masterpiece, it really is. We have a lot of great clocks in the horological archive here, but uh, you know, this is uh, this is a beauty. This was painted black, so. And a uh, mirror from the Queen Anne period, remember glass. And mirror glass could only be uh, blown so big before it dried out. And look at the silver starting to turn, so this is perfection at its best. And look at the way the orientation of the molding goes on this mirror. So look at the way the uh, orientation of the molding goes on this mirror. So, uh, and here's the entryway to get into the cage wire. So I think we're going to end today, and so I wish everyone a happy holiday, and uh, we're looking for uh, a rebound in 2021. Greg Perry, the historic preservationist, signing out.